You're making a purchase on Amazon, new headphones, maybe a few books. As you click proceed to checkout, a pop-up appears. Make your order carbon neutral for just $2.99. There's a little tree icon, some fancy graphics about fighting climate change. You pause for a moment. It's just three bucks to help the planet, right? A few weeks later, you're planning a vacation. Google Flights shows you two options, a $400 flight, or for $420, the exact same flight, but carbon neutral. Another tree icon another promise of environmental impact. These carbon offset options are everywhere now. Every click, every purchase, every flight comes with a chance to pay a little extra, ease your climate anxiety, do your part to save the planet. But what exactly happens when you click that button? Where does your money actually go? What are you paying for? The answer reveals an industry built on manipulated numbers, impossible promises, and calculations so creative they make an accountant blush. Let's start with what you're actually buying. A carbon credit is basically a certificate saying that somewhere in the world, one ton of carbon dioxide was either prevented from entering the atmosphere or removed from it. Companies sell these credits to offset your emissions, whether that's from your Amazon package's delivery truck or your cross-country flight. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, here's where it gets complicated. To generate these credits, companies need to prove they're doing something that wouldn't have happened otherwise. The most common way, making up the vast majority of carbon credits, involves trees, either protecting forests that would have been cut down or planting new ones. Carbon credits first emerged from the 1997 Kyoto Protocol, when world governments were searching for market-based solutions to climate change. The idea was revolutionary at the time. Let companies offset their admissions by paying for environmental projects elsewhere. Under the protocol's clean development mechanism, companies in developed countries could invest in emission reduction projects in developing nations. This spawned two markets. First, a regulated market for governments with binding emission targets. And second, a voluntary market for companies wanting to make environmental claims. Early carbon offset projects focused on industrial initiatives like capturing methane from landfills or upgrading inefficient power plants. But companies quickly realized these projects were expensive and complex. Forest projects offered a much more appealing alternative. They were cheaper, easier to implement, and much more marketable to the public. Who doesn't love saving trees? The voluntary market remained relatively small until the mid-2010s, with most major companies focusing on direct emission reductions. But as public pressure for climate action grew, particularly after the 2015 Paris Agreement, companies discovered carbon credits offered a convenient solution. Instead of the difficult, expensive work of reducing emissions, they could simply buy credits. Major players like Microsoft, Google, and Shell started making ambitious climate pledges largely backed by carbon credits. The new market exploded, growing from 146 million in 2016 to over 2 billion by 2022. As demand skyrocketed, new certification bodies and product developers rushed in to meet it, setting the stage for the problems that we see today. Take a forest in Brazil. A carbon credit company claims that without their protection, huge sections would be cleared for farming. They calculate how much carbon these trees store and sell credits based on the carbon that they're saving. The more trees that they claim they're protecting, the more credits they can sell. But this creates an obvious problem. How do you prove what would have happened to the forest without your intervention? What if it was never actually at risk? What if only a small portion of it would have been cleared or harvested? This is where the creative accounting begins. And trust me, these companies get very, very creative. Let's talk about how these companies decide how many carbon credits they can sell. At the center of the system is Vera, the world's largest carbon credit certifier. In 2023, a major investigation by The Guardian and Die Zeit revealed the exact mechanisms of how their certification process allows systematic overvaluation of carbon credits. Let's break down a Vera certified forest project step by step. When a company wants to generate carbon credits from a forest, they first conduct what's called a baseline analysis. This involves mapping out a specific section of forests, often tens or hundreds of thousands of acres, and creating detailed projections about its future. The investigation focused on one particular project in the Amazon basin. The company claimed they would protect 29,000 thousand hectares of rainforest from being cut down. To calculate how many carbon credits they could sell, they needed to determine two critical numbers. How much of this forest would be destroyed without their protection and how much carbon was stored in these trees. And here's where the numbers start getting questionable. The project developers looked at historical deforestation in the region from 2000 to 2010, which showed an average annual deforestation rate of about 0.8%. However, in their projections, what happened without their intervention, they claimed deforestation 
inflation rate would suddenly jump up to 4.5% annually. This massive inflation wasn't justified by any changes in local conditions. There were no new roads being built, no significant population growth, no new agricultural developments that would explain this dramatic increase. Yet this inflated projection was approved by Vera's certification process. But they didn't stop there. The project used the highest possible estimates for carbon storage in their trees. They claimed their forest stored an average of 400 tons of carbon per hectare, significantly higher than independent scientific estimates for similar forests in the region, which typically ranged from 250 to 300 tons. When researchers from the University of Cambridge analyzed the project's actual impact, they found something striking. Using satellite imagery and ground-level data, they could compare what actually happened in the forest versus similar unprotected forests in the region. The difference in deforestation rates were minimal, suggesting that most of these trees were never actually at risk. This matters because every ton of carbon they claimed to be saving generated one carbon credit, which could be sold for $15 to $20 on the carbon market. With their inflated deforestation predictions and carbon storage estimates, this single project generated millions of dollars worth of ghost credits. When researchers analyzed 87 similar Vera certified projects, they found the same pattern repeated over and over. Projects would take historical deforestation rates, multiply them by three to five times without substantial justification, and use these inflated predictions to generate millions in carbon credits. These 87 projects alone generated hundreds of millions of carbon credits. Each credit sold for between $15 to $20, creating a market worth billions of dollars. But According to the research published in Science, if you applied realistic deforestation rates and accurate carbon storage estimates, over 90% of these credits represented no real carbon reduction at all. Let's put this in perspective. When you booked that flight from New York to Los Angeles and pay $20 to make it carbon neutral, airline claims to offset about two tons of carbon emissions, roughly what your seat on that flight produces. But given that 90% of these credits are worthless, or on either not at risk land or on overstated carbon reduction, your $20 is really only offsetting about 400 pounds of carbon, less than a quarter of your flight's actual emissions. And that's assuming the credits represent any real carbon reduction at all. The reality is you're mostly paying for creative paperwork rather than environmental protection. Say you're a logging company and the forest that you're about to harvest becomes protected under land that's been purchased due to carbon credits. Instead of logging that specific forest, you turn and harvest another one instead. Protecting one particular forest isn't stopping logging companies from continuing to harvest wood at their current rates. In fact, the logging industry has only continued to increase since the beginning of the 2000s. The problem isn't just bad math, it's built into the system's DNA. Vera's certification process allows project developers to choose their own reference areas, essentially letting them cherry pick which historical data they'll use for their projections. They can select areas and time periods that show the highest deforestation rates, ignore contradictory data, and use these selective examples to justify their inflated predictions. Take another project from Peru. The developers claim their forest faced imminent destruction based on deforestation patterns from a completely different region, one that had major road construction and agricultural expansion. Their own project area had no such development pressure, but Vera's certification process allowed them to use this misleading comparison. When journalists tried to verify the claims these projects were making, they hit another disturbing pattern, lack of transparency. Many projects refused to share their raw data. Others provided documents with key calculations obscured or missing. Some even claimed their methodology was proprietary information, meaning there was no way to independently verify their claims. But here's what makes the system nearly impossible to fix. Everyone benefits from the inflation. Project developers make more money, certification bodies like Vera collect more fees, and the companies buying these credits get to make grand environmental claims at a fraction of what it would cost to actually reduce their emissions. When researchers analyzed hundreds of similar projects from around the industry, they found the same pattern repeated over and over. Projects would take historical deforestation rates, multiply them by three to five times without substantial justification, and use these inflated predictions to generate millions in carbon credits. But this wasn't just a Vera problem. The same pattern emerged across multiple certification bodies. Take the Nature Conservancy, America's largest environmental group. 
An investigation revealed they were generating carbon credits from land they had already owned and managed, forests that were never going to be logged in the first place. In Massachusetts, they sold credits for protecting trees on rocky cliffs where logging wasn't even physically possible. In Zimbabwe, carbon credit developer South Pole ran into the same creative math problem. They sold millions in carbon credits based on protecting a forest from what they claimed was inevitable destruction. But when investigators started asking questions about their deforestation predictions, their story fell apart. South Pole had to suspend all sales from the project and admit their calculations weren't based on realistic threats to the forest. Even Shell's massive Gorgon capture project in Australia followed this pattern. While not a forest project, it demonstrated the same creative accounting. The project promised to capture capture 80% of emissions, but actually only managed to capture 30%. Yet they'd already sold carbon credits based on their optimistic projections, which those companies were still able to claim as full offsets regardless. Now, how does that make any sense? Less than half of the carbon was actually captured that was promised, yet the companies still got to take credit and offset it as if the project had been 100% successful. This is no industry exception. If anything, it's the rule of law. What makes these cases is significant is how they all follow the same playbook. Number one, make dire predictions about future emissions or deforestation. Number two, use creative calculations that are difficult for outsiders to verify. Number three, get certified by bodies that have a financial interest in improving projects. Number four, sell credits based on these inflated numbers. And number five, when questioned, cite proprietary methodologies or refuse to share data. And who's buying these questionable credits? Some of the biggest companies in the world. Disney purchased millions and rainforest credits from Vera to claim their theme parks were making progress towards carbon neutrality. Netflix offset their entire 2021 carbon footprint using these same type of credits. Gucci went as far as declaring themselves carbon neutral, largely based on forest protection credits, most of which came from the same certification systems. Shell and BP, while publicly championing environmental responsibility, bought millions in credits from these same projects. JetBlue announced their domestic flights were carbon neutral thanks to carbon credits, many of those from the same forest protection schemes. And even tech giants like Microsoft included these credits in their environmental plans, though they have since shifted away from them after the scandals have broke. These credits aren't just ineffective, they're actively preventing achievable environmental progress. Take Coca-Cola, the world's largest plastic polluter. In 2019, they pledged to make their operations carbon neutral through a combination of renewable energy and carbon credits. But while heavily promoting their credit purchases, they quietly scaled back their goals for reusable plastic, a proven way to reduce both emissions and plastic waste. Their original target was 25% reusable plastic by 20 2025. But after implementing their carbon credit program, they reduced that number to just 10%, setting the credits as part of their alternative approach to sustainability. Shell's Deer Park refinery in Texas provides another concrete example. In 2018, they canceled planned equipment upgrades that would have reduced actual emissions by 15%, instead opting to purchase carbon credits. The upgrades, while more expensive upfront, would have created permanent emission reductions. Instead, they spent a fraction of that cost on questionable forest credits. Major retailers like Walmart and Target have used carbon credits to justify delaying proven emission reduction strategies like converting their trucking fleets to more efficient vehicles or sourcing their power from some renewables. These are existing viable technologies that could create real emission reductions, but companies opt for cheaper credits instead. The tech industry shows similar patterns. Data centers could reduce their actual emissions through improved cooling systems and local renewable energy, but many opt for carbon credits instead, as they cost roughly one-tenth of these actual improvements. The process repeats itself again and again. Companies across the industry are able to buy carbon credits as cheap PR cover, rather than put in the work needed to actually reduce their carbon footprint. And as long as they're able, and most consumers are unaware, they'll continue to do it and appear like they're truly making a difference. But here's what makes this system nearly impossible to fix without legal intervention and enforcement. Everyone in the chain profits from keeping things exactly as they are. Let's follow the money. The product developers make more money when they predict higher deforestation rates. More threatened trees equals more carbon credits to sell. The certification bodies like Vera, they get paid for every project they certify. There's no financial incentive to reject projects or demand stricter standards. The consultants and auditors who verify these projects, they're hired by the same companies they're supposed to be monitoring. Question too many projects and suddenly you stop getting contracts. The same firms show up over and over in project documentation 
Corporation repeatedly signing off on these questionable calculations. Major corporations buying these credits have no incentive to look too closely either. They're getting environmental credentials for pennies on the dollar compared to actually reducing their emissions. Disney can claim their theme parks are approaching carbon neutrality without changing how they operate. Airlines can advertise carbon neutral flights while burning the same amount of fuel. Tech companies can offset massive data centers without reducing their energy consumption. Even when scandals break, the system just keeps rolling. In January 2023, The Guardian published their devastating investigation, revealing that more than 90% of Vera's rainforest carbon credits were worthless. Major companies like The Guardian, BBC, and L'Oreal immediately announced they would review their use of these credits. Yet by the end of 2023, Vera was still the dominant force in the carbon markets. They simply rebranded their forestry credits as VCS, JNR, Red Plus, and continued operations. Their response to this scandal? They just claimed their new methodology would be more accurate, while still allowing projects to make their own baseline predictions about deforestation rates. South Pole's response to their Zimbabwe scandal was equally telling. After admitting in June 2023 that their calculations were severely flawed, they suspended sales from just that one project. But the other forest projects using similar calculation methods continued generating and selling credits. By early 2024, they were still one of the largest carbon credit developers in the market. Nature Conservancy after being exposed for selling credits in forests that were never at risk, they conducted an internal review, adjusted some practices, but continued their carbon credit programs. They're still selling forest carbon credits today, using many of the same baseline calculation methods that were criticized. What's most revealing is how corporations have responded. Despite these scandals, major companies haven't abandoned carbon credits. They've just gotten better at obscuring their use of them. Many now bundle carbon credits into larger environmental initiatives, making it harder to track exactly how many questionable credits they're still buying. And while all this continues, the environmental cost keeps mounting. Every worthless carbon credit doesn't just represent wasted money, it represents real emissions that aren't being offset. When an airline sells you a carbon neutral flight based on these credits, those emissions aren't actually being canceled out. When a tech company claims their data centers are green because of forest credits, that electricity is still coming from fossil fuels. The system has created a dangerous illusion of progress. Companies can claim they're addressing climate change without actually reducing their emissions. Governments point to the growing carbon credit market as evidence that voluntary corporate action is working, and the public is left with this false impression that paying a few dollars to offset their purchases is making a real difference. What's worse, these credits are actually being used to justify new emissions. Companies are getting approval for new projects, new developments, and expanded operations based on promises to offset their impact using these credits. It's like getting a permit to dump toxic waste in a river because you promised to maybe clean up another river somewhere else. Except in this case, even that cleanup is mostly fictional. The reality is that without serious regulation and enforcement, this pattern will continue. As long as companies can generate credits through creative accounting rather than actual carbon reduction, they will. As long as certification bodies profit from approving projects rather than scrutinizing them, they will. And as long as major corporations can buy environmental credibility for pennies on the dollar, they will, but there might be a glimmer of change on the horizon. The solution is actually straightforward, even if the political will isn't there yet. Mandatory third-party oversight and strict government regulation of carbon markets. Just like we have financial auditors and security regulators to prevent fraud in financial markets, we need independent verification of these carbon credit claims. Some governments are starting to move in that direction. The European Union has proposed new standards for carbon credits, requiring rigorous verification of climate benefits. California's carbon market already has stricter oversight than the voluntary market, and surprise, their credits tend to deliver more of their promised benefits. But until those regulations become widespread and enforcement becomes serious, companies will continue to choose the path of least resistance, buying cheap, questionable credits rather than making real reductions to their emissions. If you're a company and you can offset your emissions for cents or dollars that appear the same to most customers, you will always go with cents. So the next time you see that little pop-up asking if you want to make your purchase carbon neutral, remember, without real oversight, your payment might not be going quite as far as you thought.